mai te tīmatatanga ko te kore, te pō nui, te pō roa, te pō pamama. He ao, he ao, he awa tea, ti hei mauri ora. In the beginning there was the nothingness, the dark, the surrounding blackness, the void. Then there is light, the dawn, the world of light, the first breath of life. No mai haere mai, ngā tangata no ngā hoe fa, ki te tuwhera tanga o te wānanga mo te rā o ngā kai whakawhānai o te ao. Rua mano te kaumarima. It is my privilege and honour to welcome you all to the International Day of the Midwife Virtual Conference 2015. I have begun with a karanga, which is a traditional Māori welcome, and it was followed by an ancient chant depicting a Māori worldview of the beginning of life. Ko rā paki ki te wai paunamu tō kuturanga waiwai, ko kaitahu te iwi, ko tumanako tōku ingoa, he taura kai whakawhānau o. Kia ora, my name is Tumanako Stone Howard, and I am a Māori midwifery student from Aotearoa, New Zealand. My family come from Rā, and my tribe is Kaitahu. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome and warm greetings to one and all. For childbirth. And the knowledge that what we do is really profoundly important. So welcome one and all, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you, Deb. Um, this is Linda Wiley um, speaking now as the chair of this session. Um, before we start, can I just check with Sarah that she's got sound? Can you speak to us, Sarah? Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Fabulous, that's absolutely fine then. Um, I'll just run, I will say very little, we'll get cracking um, because uh, obviously we've been a bit delayed. It's, it's all these time zones, they catch us all muddled up um, periodically. So um, welcome to the Virtual International Day of the Midwife. Um, Sarah Buckley is um, a, a doctor from New Zealand, well, do doctor who was trained in New Zealand and she's got a great interest in my favourite topic which is oxytocin. Um, and I'm going to say no more than that. 
uh, I'll let her introduce herself and I'll just quickly run through these initial slides so we can get to Sarah's um, presentation. So, we've said all this already. Um, hoping that you've all had a chance to set yourself up for this um, meeting. There is an audio setup wizard at the top if you fancy speaking later on and uh, asking some questions. You have to work through the audio setup in order to um, speak. We do have the chat window, which we have been using in our time of um, waiting here. Um, and you'll be aware of, that you can use this. But try not to say to, to talk away from the topic um, once Sarah starts her presentation. Um, you can give us feedback by uh, um, using the status symbols. You'll see at the top of the screen the little man with his hand up. Use him, and there's a variety of feedback um, mechanisms there uh, that you can use. I've already made comment about that. If you want to make your mic, if we give you permission to use your microphone, you'll need to click the little green thing. Well, it can be white at the moment. Little green thing at the top of the screen. Um, you may need to adjust your microphone. We'll discuss that in the chat box if it comes to anything. And we're already recording this um, session. So, can I just hand over to Sarah then, with delight that she's managed to make it um, with our time differences, and let you introduce yourself, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. What a pleasure it is to be here and to be um, opening the virtual International Day of Midwives because midwives are my heroes. And what I've discovered through my interest and research in hormonal physiology is that midwives are heroes of hormonal physiology. So that's what we're talking about today. Now, this presentation is based on my report called Hormonal Physiology of Childbearing, Evidence and Implications for Women, Babies and Maternity Care, published back in January through um, Childbirth Connection and the National Partnership for Women and Families. Can you put your hand up if you've read this report? Uh, beautiful. Let's have a look. Can you, can you put up your hand if you intend to read this report? I'm not seeing that there. Linda, can you just message me what we're getting there? Beautiful. Thank you. Well, my intention is that by the end of my presentation, you'll all be intending to read this report because um, it really is a great resource for midwives and for midwifery. And this is what it looks like, so you'll recognize it. That, um, that URL is on the next slide too. But if you search hormonal physiology online, you'll find it there. So the intentions of my presentation is to honour, acknowledge and applaud midwives from over here in Brisbane. There's a big round of applause because I really think that what you do has enormous implications, not just for the mother and baby in your care, but for that mother and baby ongoingly, probably the rest of their lives from a hormonal physiology perspective and also for society as a whole. So thank you so much for what you, work, what you do in the world and the enormous impact of the work that you do. I also want to provide some midwifery focused highlights of the report and that will be obvious and to stimulate your interest to read more in the report and to share because as I said it really is a great resource. You know um, it's the it's, uh, um, evidence that underpins so much of what you do and what you know and that's really been um, my passion for a number of years now. So a little bit more about me, I'm a GP or family physician, I have a diploma of obstetrics. Currently I'm not working in that way, I'm a full time writer. My um, article, Ecstatic Birth, Nature's Hormonal Blueprint for Labour, which was published in Mothering Magazine. And that article is was written for parents, so it's fairly, you know, it's, it's a little bit technical, but it's understandable by anyone with a, a lay background. And you can go to my website, sarahbuckley.com, and download that as an ebook. And then um, Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering is my book from 2009 that has even more about hormonal physiology. So it really was very exciting for me to, to do this report, which is expanding that, that um, knowledge even more. The report's over 200 pages. We've got over 1,100 um, studies in there. So really a lot of evidence and a lot of, a lot of what we know. But also, as you read the report, you'll find some of the most important things is what we don't know. So we'll talk a little about that in this presentation as well. So my first question is, how are midwives heroic? Why do I say that? Well, I only need to look as far as the Cochrane Collaboration to find this um, systematic review, midwife-led continuity models versus other models of care for childbearing women. And the authors of that conclude that continuity of midwifery care has significant benefits for mothers and babies. And these are just some of them, fewer epidurals, fewer instrumental births, more spontaneous vaginal, vaginal births 
fewer episiotomies and more maternal satisfaction. And I could probably do a whole lecture on each of those points in relation to hormonal physiology, but I'm just going to pick out a few of those. I also really recommend this paper here, which was published in the Lancet series last year about midwifery, midwifery and quality care findings from a new evidence-informed framework for maternal and newborn care. And this, this, um, this study um, by, by Mary Renfrew and colleagues looks more widely at um, the research on midwifery and its impacts on mothers and babies, and there's some really great findings in there. It's a really great summary. So that's the how. Now, why are midwives heroes of hormonal physiology? I just want to start by looking a little bit wider and say that midwives are heroic because you have a salutogenic approach to childbearing. Now, if you don't know that term salutogenic, I recommend that you, um, you take it up and use it liberally because salutogenic means promoting positive health and well-being. And that really is the cornerstone of what you do in pr is promoting positive health and well-being in relation to pregnancy, in relation to labour and birth, in relation to postpartum for mothers and babies. And by the way, the report is a PDF document. We don't actually have an index. But what you do is you use the PDF finder. And if you search, for, for example, type in the term salutogenic, you can find it everything I have to say about salutogenic in the report. Now, midwives are also heroic because you value physiologic childbearing. And we define physiologic childbearing as childbearing conforming to healthy biologic processes. We're not exclusive in our um, definitions of that. We don't say it's this and not that. But what we say is that physiologic childbearing is a continuum. And there's obviously full physiology at one end and minimal physiology at another end. And the aim, really, of the report and the recommendations is to encourage people to think from a physiologic, from a hormonal physiology perspective, and move, move women along. How can we add more hormonal physiology for mothers and babies in this in this situation, whether it's an a pre labor caesarean, an in labor caesarean, you know, a physiologic labor and birth? And you also know, I hope, that you're very skilled in non pharmacological approaches to labor pain and progress. And of course, those are the two things where there's most intervention and where the hormonal physiology ends up being substantially disrupted often, as we'll find out. So being skilled in non pharmacological approaches really avoids lots of disruptions. And we'll, we'll touch on that as we go through here. So you optimize hormonal physiology from my perspective. And that's talking about these four hormone systems. So the, um, the hormone systems, and I say they're not just hormones, they're hormone systems. It includes what regulates those hormones, how those hormones act in the body, what increases them, what decreases them, what happens in the lead up to labor, and their receptor systems as well. Because as you probably know, a hormone is a chemical made in one part of the body that travels to another part where it has effects. And they have effects by operating with, um, with by binding with receptor systems, which sends a signal into the cell and has an effect. So we'll t touch a little bit on that as well. But we focus on these hormone hormone systems: oxytocin, beta endorphins, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and related stress hormones and prolactin. There's a chapter on each of those hormone systems in the report. And we focus on those in relation to childbearing. And I'm going to say a little bit about that. We're not just talking about childbirth, about labor and birth. We're talking about childbearing, which also includes pregnancy, which also includes postpartum. And, and, and particularly, as we'll talk a little bit about here, includes breastfeeding and attachment. So oxytocin, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize about 100 and something pages in the report down to four slides. So I might have to hang on. This is a bit of a quick ride, a quick romp through hormonal physiology. But I just want to make sure you've got a little bit of background before we add in some more things. So oxytocin, our most famous breast uh, birth hormone, is a hormone of sexual activity, labor birth, lactation, and attachment. And it has effects both in the body and in the mind. And you can see that there. That's actually me breastfeeding my daughter Maya when she was three. And you can see the little oxytocin love bubble. And you can also see that lactation is happening. So oxytocin has effects by reducing fear and stress and our physiologic responses to fear and stress. And what that means, in, in a sense, is that it increases activity in what we call the parasympathetic nervous system. If you remember your midwifery training, it's the rest and digest, calm and connect, relaxation and growth system, and reducing activity in the sympathetic, which is the stress system, the fight or flight system. So it shifts our physiologic balance. It also has intrinsic analgesic properties. It's a pain relieving in its own right, which is kind of useful in labor and birth. And it also activates motivation and reward centers in the mother's brain or in the brain of anyone that's having oxytocin released. And you'll see that that's a bit of a theme amongst all of these hormones. So in a sense, we could say it's giving
rewarded through oxytocin. But not only that, but also rewarded through beta endorphins. Oh, thanks, Linda. I'll slow down a little bit. So our second hormone system that we talk about is beta endorphins, which are the body's stress system, if you like. We release them when we're under stress and pain, and they act as analgesic or stress-reducing hormones. So you can see this beautiful picture of a woman in her beta endorphin state. But also, like oxytocin, they also activate motivation and reward centers. So sometimes I say it's like Mother Nature patting us on the back, saying you've done a good job, do more of it, you know, make more babies, have more babies, breastfeed and attach to your baby. So these are, are really important hormones in relation to switching on those reward systems. And those reward systems, it's really one of the findings that, um, that surprised me in uh, the research. These reward systems are actually really important. Um, um, they're switched on during labour and birth, and particularly now after birth. And then this turning on of those systems, this activating, then ongoingly rewards the mother for contact with her baby. And that, of course, is a substantial contribution to infant well-being and infant survival in all mammals, but also including humans. So our third um, hormone, hormonal system that we talk about, epinephrine, norepinephrine, you may know that as adrenaline and noradrenaline. We also um, talk about related stress hormones, prim hormones, primarily cortisol. So as you probably know, they're released with fight or flight, shifting blood away from the non-essential organs to the parts of the body we need for fight or flight. So in childbearing, that's really important because if we have a surge of epinephrine, norepinephrine, that can decrease blood flow to our uterus. It's, it's a non-essential organ for fight or flight in this situation. And it, they also have a direct effect on the um, labor, on the labor muscle, on the, sorry, the uterine muscle of reducing uter labor contractions. So they generally, a surge of these hormones will um, switch labor off and give the mother that space for fight or flight. However, in late labor, both mother and baby get a surge of these hormones. And that has two important functions for the mother and for the baby. It promotes effective pushing, that's called the fetus ejection reflex. And again, if you want to know more about the fetus ejection reflex, you can search for it in that little PDF search, um, search window. And also the late labor um, catecholamine surge, as we call it, is really important for the baby. It gives the baby protection from those long, strong, close together contractions. And it also begins to prepare the baby for life outside the womb. So that transition to life outside the womb is really optimized by the catecholamine surge for the baby. Cortisol also matures the fetal organs um, even before labor starts. You know, we know, you probably know that because we give cortisol-like drugs to mature the baby's lungs in the situation of threatened premature labor. But that's what happens naturally in the lead up to labor, preparing the baby for labor and for that um, transition of birth. So our fourth hormone system that we talk about in the report, and by the way, um, oxytocin is chapter three, four, five, six. So you can find you know, all about prolactin in chapter three, all about oxytocin, oh, sorry, oxytocin chapter three, beta endorphin chapter four, epinephrine, nor epinephrine chapter five, prolactin chapter six. So prolactin is a major hormone of breast milk synthesis, and you probably know its most famous role, prolactation. But it also promotes many physiologic adaptations to maternity in the mother's body, for example, nutrition, fluid balance, and in her brain as well. It's a major hormone of maternal behaviors. Here we have again, it's a hormone of sexual activity, labor, birth, lactation, and attachment. So there's quite a theme with these hormones as well in what they're involved with inside reproduction and also outside reproduction as well. Uh, it's also been called the hormone of paternity because in any species where the father is involved in care of the young, prolactin is involved. Okay, so that's our sort of basic hormonal systems and um, I hope that you've got some of that under your belt as we begin to talk about how midwives are heroes of hormonal physiology and how you benefit hormonal physiology for mothers and babies. So fewer epidurals under midwifery care and that's really significant because epidurals can impact all of our physiologic hormonal systems. They reduce oxytocin, and I'll talk a little more about that, how that may happen. They reduce beta endorphins because beta endorphins are hormones of stress and pain, and if suddenly there's no stress and pain, the body goes, oh, we don't need the beta endorphins. They also um, unbalance, we could say, the epinephrine nor epinephrine system because they reduce epinephrine more than nor epinephrine, and that explains some of the side effects that you'll know from um, epidurals. And they also disrupt, as far as we know, prolactin. Not so much research on that, but from the research that we have, the pattern is disrupted. 
So some of the epidural side effects, for example, the drop in blood pressure that inevitably happens for women when they're giving an, given an epidural, it may not be obvious because of the, most women are preloaded given a large amount of fluid beforehand, but this is probably to do with the epinephrine nor epinephrine system. Also the uterine hyperactivity that happens for some women just after the epidural is put in place probably happens because of that sudden drop in pain and that sudden drop in epinephrine adrenaline we're talking about. Um, the fever um, side effects that can happen for some women with epidurals may be related to oxytocin. Oxytocin is actually um, a hormone that's involved in um, temperature regulation. And also instrumental birth, we know that that's a side effect of epidurals and it's probably to do with that reduction in oxytocin, that the oxytocin's not there to give those powerful late labour contractions to help the mother to push her baby out quickly and easily. So it also, if it has impacts on all of these hormones, could it also have impacts on these ongoing effects of the hormones? So you'd have to go to the report to read how these hormones positively impact breastfeeding, mother baby. Point one point four. That's oxytocin after the birth. Um, to 4.1.4 um, beta endorphins after the birth, all the 1.4 sections describe the functions of these hormones after the birth. So these hormones, oxytocin, beta endorphins, prolactin, as I mentioned, are involved with breastfeeding. So if we interfere with these hormone systems through an epidural, could that interfere with breastfeeding? It's a bit of a $6 million question, highly debated in the literature, but you can get my take on that by looking in section 3.2.5, all those sections down the bottom there, they're the sections that look at the impact of epidurals on each of the hormone session, uh, hormone systems. So the mother-baby attachment, similarly oxytocin, beta endorphins, nor epinephrine is actually a hormone of mother-baby attachment and prolactin. And all of these hormones contribute to what I sometimes call an ecstatic, um, euphoric feelings after the birth and maternal satisfaction ongoingly by switching on these reward systems. So if those hormones are impacted, is maternal satisfaction and even ongoing maternal reward going to be impacted? And again, that's another really important question that we haven't begun to look at in relation to hormonal physiology. So you're also heroic because you have, you increase the chance of spontaneous vaginal, vaginal birth. And um, why does that happen? How to how? What's the mechanism by which that happens? And one mechanism may be that you that that it reduces the risk of epidurals. Midwives also tend to work on alternative settings, which is associated with more spontaneous vaginal births. You also tend to help to women to delay the admission until the active phase of labour, and that's the subject of a of a um, Cochrane review. That's Lauzon 09. So you can look up that to look at all the evidence around that. But that's important in relation to hormone physiology, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, less augmentation in some studies um, of midwifery models of care. And again, if we're reducing augmentation, reducing women's exposure to synthetic oxytocin, that may increase the risk of spontaneous vaginal birth. And you also are masterful at attention to emotional well-being in labour. You know, in our current maternity care system, that tends to be quite down on the list of priorities in labour. But um, you know, midwives, you know how important emotional well-being is in labour because emotional well-being is about optimising the flow of those hormones, which is going to promote um, hormonal physiology. So I'm going to say something a little bit about how labour works and the positive feedback loops of cycles of active labour. And what I describe, the way I describe the process of labour, I say it's a bit like a snowball. It starts small and it rolls and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and in the end becomes unstoppable. So if we delay admission of women until they're in that active, unstoppable part of labour, then the processes of going to hospital and the stress that's involved in that isn't going to interfere with the flow of labour, isn't going to stop the progress of labour. Whereas if we go earlier when labour's that small snowball, if you like, it's much more easily um, dis or e easily disrupted. And one of the reasons labour has this snowballing effect is because there's a lot of positive feedback cycles that, um, that progress labour. And this is one of them. If you look at that picture there, you can see if you start in the top right hand corner that as labour goes on, there's an increase in, in, in sensations. And what happens is that those sensations are fed back into the brain and they actually increase the central release of oxytocin. 
So more oxytocin is released, more oxytocin goes to the uterus in the bottom left. There's more contractions, more sensations, more central oxytocin release. So that's a positive feedback loop. And that may be familiar to you. That's actually the Ferguson reflex that we talk about that promotes the pushing stage of labour. But what we think is that this um, positive feedback loop actually happens right the way through labour. So central oxytocin release within the brain, it also accelerates central oxytocin release as a positive feedback loop within the brain. And those effects may be even greater in um, women who've given birth before, or animals have given birth before, I should say, but probably explains why labour goes faster in women as well. You also reduce, you know, if it's reducing um, the chance of augmentation in labour, that's reducing exposure to synthetic oxytocin. And I hope that you're familiar with this, that prolonged exposure to constant high levels of synthetic oxytocin reduces the number of uterine oxytocin receptors. If you don't believe me, look in the package insert for your own particular version of synthetic oxytocin. And if we reduce the number of uterine oxytocin receptors, it reduces the sensitivity and effects of oxytocin. So it could slow labour progress, increase instrumental birth, and increase postpartum hemorrhage. And again, I'll refer you to that section of the report to find out more about those things. Emotional well-being, as I said, you know how important that is. As midwives, it's part of your job is to attend to women's emotional well-being in labour. And there's a, a large section, 5.2.1, about stress in labour. And stress can disrupt labour, and there are several possible mechanisms. It's not something that's well-researched, but excessive epinephrine, norepinephrine, directly, as I mentioned before, reduces uterine contractions. It may reduce the release of oxytocin as well. Excessive beta endorphins with stress in labour may reduce central oxytocin within the brain. Stress itself may reduce the pulsatile release of oxytocin, and stress may also alter the patterns of prolactin release. So there's many hormonal explanations for how stress may impact labour progress. But basically, as you, I'm sure you know as midwife, stress does impact labour progress, so paying attention to women's emotional well-being in labour is really important. So in summary, you're my heroes of hormonal physiology because you optimise hormonal physiology for mothers and babies, which benefits labour and birth, optimises hormonal support for breastfeeding with ongoing and probably lifelong effects. Again, you can look at um, more about that in the report. There's a lot actually in the report, and I'm not mentioning it today, about epigenetics. So I really recommend you, you go into the search box and type epigenetics. So optimising hormonal support for that mother-baby attachment, again I talk a lot about that in the report, search attachment, search bonding with ongoing and probably as far as we know lifelong benefits for mothers and babies. So thank you for listening, um, for more information please access the report, there it is again, um, childbirthconnection.org slash report slash physiology and um, I really recommend that you go and look at that. There's also several, um, several uh, women friendly resources on there, there's infographics, there's actually a, a booklet explaining the hormonal physiology in simple language accessible to women as well. So go to that website, download the report, it's all free, I should, should have said that at the beginning, 100% free, 100% downloadable and um, you know, use it for yourself in your practice, use it to inform and resource um, the, your peers and the people you're you know, you're working with, tell the obstetricians about it. It's really important information for them. And that's the next stage of my, the next stage of my birthing of this report is to write some um, papers, some articles in some of the peer review journals. So I've got a big job ahead of me, not just giving birth to this baby, but also growing it up and really getting it there into the mainstream. And I'd love you all as midwives around the world to partners in, um, in being heroes of hormonal physiology. So that's my last slide and um, let's see what questions or comments you have about hormonal physiology. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> if anybody would like to um, verbally ask a question, please just pop up your hand. Um, or if you want to ask questions in the box, just as well, doing it that way. Yes, Holly, it is fascinating how everything is linked and every action has a consequence. And you know, um, what I love when I present this material to midwives, as I do in my workshops around the world, it explains so much.
breastfeed more easily, attach to their babies more easily because what we think is happening in their brain, and this is from animal studies and we obviously can't do this on women, is those um, the receptors in the brain that promote some of those positive feedback loops, there's more receptors in multiparous females and so that all those positive feedback loops go faster, so really interesting. and. Um, when you're next coming to the UK, yes, I was in the UK in 2011 and 2013. It's a long way, <laughs> 24 hours on a plane, and also, you know, I've got to go for a fair length of time, and I'm a little bit, um, you know, a, a little bit, uh, well, not constricted really, but my youngest daughter's in senior high school now, so I don't want to go away for prolonged periods of time for a couple of years still, but uh, yeah, definitely in the future. So anyway, you're asking me, do I think home birth optimizes? Physiologic hormonal physiology. Well, yes, definitely, because all those things that we talked about, it reduces the chances of interventions. And you know, we only talked about um, epidurals, but other interventions like synthetic oxytocin. There's a very long section about the impacts, possible, known, unknown, of synthetic oxytocin for mothers and babies. I really recommend you read that. That's a really important section. It reduces the chance of augmentation, induction, and induction has enormous consequences as well. You know, um, and again, I'm going to refer you to chapter two, which is called Physio The Physiologic Onset of Labour and Scheduled Birth. And I go through everything that happens before the onset of labour and then what happens when we disrupt that with scheduled birth. And some of the important things that happen, as far as we know, mostly from animal studies, some human studies, is that the receptors for all these systems increase in the lead up to labour. So that um, in the in the weeks and days, and in human stu in animal studies, even hours before the onset of labour, all these things are getting set up to optimise the efficiency of labour and birth, the efficiency of pushing, the efficiency of contracting the uterus after birth to prevent postpartum hemorrhage, and the efficiency of attachment and lactation. And so, you know, you may be aware of all of. The, um, the interest at the moment in elective induction is should we be inducing women routinely to prevent stillbirth to reduce the risk of caesareans. Again, there's a few comments in there in my report about that. But we haven't even begun to look at the hormonal physiology implications of induction and missing out on those critical preparations and leading up to labour. And you know, the studies that are happening right now, the 3539 study and the ARRIVE study, they don't they don't even measure breastfeeding as an outcome, which is extraordinary. And you can also read in the report, there's lots of tidbits here. Um, prostaglandins, you know, we think that's an easy way of inducing women. They actually have an anti-prolactin effect, and they 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 probably reduce um, the the chance. In fact, the one study that was done, the um, the um, the Welsh study, the uh, the Cardiff study, did show an impact of prostaglandins on the chance of successful breastfeeding at 48 hours. So, so many things that we're doing have. Um, um, Possible, you know, there's physiologic mechanisms whereby they, they probably do affect hormonal physiology, but we haven't begun to look at that. So, yes, definitely, Anna, and I think the, you know the the most you know the most um, effective ways that we can enhance hormonal physiology is to you know, put women in a setting where you know where these, the chance of these things is reduced, and where, as we talked about with um, with stress, where the chance of them being stressed in labour is reduced, and that's going to optimise the flow of their hormones as well. So yeah, it gives, and, and we talk, we talk. So there's a section in there which is the one point four sections, which is the time after birth. So if you're interested in the physiology of the hour after birth and how the interactions between mother and baby promote maternal oxytocin release, even up to ten times through those interactions with her baby. So having mother and baby together increases her own flow of oxytocin, which has all those benefits of contracting uterus and preventing hemorrhage. And you know, thank you to the New Zealand researchers as well for you know the, the, the work that you're doing in um, the chance of postpartum hemorrhage related to physiologic childbearing. And there's really increasing evidence that physiologic childbearing, if we're not I interfering with the oxytocin system through some of these interventions, especially epidurals and synthetic oxytocin, then the chance of bleeding after birth is, 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 is normal, we could say, it's not reduced, yeah. So, you know, physiologic childbearing and physiologic um, third stage are, are, are eminently compatible um, in, my, in my word and we're getting increasingly evidence to support that. Mm. So yeah, the overuse of synthetic oxytocin, Catherine, definitely, you know, read that chapter. I really haven't had a chance to, to talk about that, but that's a big focus of the report as well. Very um, controversial, but uh, you know, why aren't we looking at that? Why we know all about oxytocin outside reproduction? Why aren't we looking at the, the possible impacts and epigenetics in relation to its use in labour and birth? Yeah. Whoa, Kath, Kerry, and you're asking me a big question. How do we how do we address women's general social psyche emotional states? 
um, in pregnancy, you know, an unwell emotional state. And look, I do, there's actually a section on stress in pregnancy and there was a great systematic review of um, of interventions to improve, um, reduce stress in pregnancy. So again, I'm going to refer you back to the document to look at that. Obviously, we can't change women's social situation to a large extent in pregnancy, but there's things we can do. There's tools that have been shown to be effective for reducing stress in pregnancy, which, as you say, then goes on to um, to impact stress in labour. So again, that section for 5.2.1 is all about stress in pregnancy, stress in labour. So. Okay, please remember to complete that. I'm going to ask you a final question. So who's going to go out and read the report? <laughs> Put your hand up for me. <laughs> I want to see everybody's hands up. That's my intention. Okay, I think we're out of time now. So thank you all very much for coming along for your questions questions and um, stay tuned. I'm going to, my intention is to actually do a series of webinars later in the year looking at each of these subjects. We, you know, I could do a whole webinar on synthetic oxytocin, on attachment, on epidurals. There's a lot of topics in there which I'll also be writing up as papers for peer review journals. But um, if you want to find out about that, go to my website, sarahbuckley.com and get into my e-list and you'll also get a copy of the Ecstatic Birth um, ebook for free when you do that. So if you want to find out more what's happening in hormonal physiology and how we're getting this work out. And I'm also looking at um, putting a Facebook page together called Hormonal Physiology Revolution. So let's um, let's get that happening. But again, go to my um, my website and sign up for and you can find out all about that. Thank you, Sarah. There's Absolutely loads no, of people I don't, putting their hands yeah. <clears throat> There are lots of people putting up their hands now. Um, Sarah, and I'm sure that we will all be going to read your, yeah, because this this is the bread and butter of um, midwifery, of course, and we, we, we need someone who can explain all of this to us. It's um, very complex, but we know in our hearts, we know instinctively as midwives that this is the art of midwifery that you're talking about here, letting women's own hormones do the work for them. So thank you so very much um, for this rather rush, rather quick um, journey through the hormones and what we do. So, <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. We, we'll look forward to the webinars.